This uh, uh, lecture is on radiation safety in fluoroscopically guided procedures. And my name is uh, Keish Patel, and I work for a company called Unicorn Physics Inc. We consult to uh, hospitals in uh, imaging related issues, which means MRI, CT, and mammography, nuclear medicine, ultrasound. And we consult with um, image quality aspects of uh, the, those machines, and also the radiation doses that these machines give out and uh, also we calculate uh, uh, any fetal doses or patient exposures that uh, people are concerned about uh, so that's why we're employed or rather uh, we're con uh, attached to this hospital. Uh, the uh, rules re regulating fluoroscopy, is, as far as the radiation safety is concerned, uh, are handed down by a committee called the Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors, Inc. And this consists of scientists and uh, hospital administrators uh, across the country. And every once in a while, they will get together and they will review uh, what uh, other international agencies, like the International Atomic Agency Authority, uh, the uh, National Radiation Protection Board, and other agencies what they recommend and usually these higher agencies make recommendations and uh, and uh, uh, for about 10 15 years uh, they debate them and uh, issues are covered and then eventually the CRCPD will get to it and they will suggest changes or additions to the rules and regulations and they get they then get passed down to what's called state suggested regulations SSRs and once it gets down there individual state uh, departments uh, are, uh, get a hold of this document and then they uh, debate whether to include them as part of the state rules or not and eventually it becomes uh, once the state takes it up uh, and uh, it goes through the usual process of uh, becoming law uh, the state then regulates uh, x-ray related issues so x-ray is something that is uh, controlled by the states not the uh, federal government uh, as far as uh, radiation safety is concerned. Whereas in nuclear medicine, the radioisotope that they use there is typically controlled by the federal government. So even though they're both ionizing radiation, uh, the two are controlled by different agencies. I know it's confusing, but that's the way it is. Uh, OK. As far as uh, fluoroscopy uh, radiation uh, safety is concerned, uh, what are these goals and specific recommendations? Uh, you have to try to. Uh, identify the high-risk procedures, uh, identify the range of exposures uh, that uh, uh, the patient can get, uh, be able to perform the risk-benefit analysis, license uh, and uh, credential the trained staff, and grant privileges guidelines. Uh, the high-risk procedures, uh, this is obviously determined uh, purely by uh, the physicians who do these procedures, uh, not by uh, physicists like myself or administrators. Uh, you guys get together and you say, okay, this is going to be a PTCA. This is typically how long it's going to take. These are the kind of patients we will be doing this procedure on. And you'll you all come to an agreement. And for example, and I'm just throwing a number out here, let's say that a, t a procedure is supposed to take 10 minutes and you're all in agreement with that. Uh, eventually, you know, uh, some procedure, some doctor will carry this procedure out and probably take 60 minutes over it. And so that's wrong. There's something wrong there. You know, so someone needs training there. So that's why, uh, uh, y you know, you, you try to do uh, the second one, which is identify the range of exposures for this particular procedure. Also, uh, the, the third one, perform a risk benefit analysis. This is what uh, this lecture is about, is to give you guys an idea of how to minimize the, the risk and increase the benefit to the patient. Uh, if you, uh, uh, I know for cardiologists and for radiologists, uh, you go through your residency program, you have substantial amount of training with radiation uh, related activities, so you guys are trained, but there are other doctors, uh, other specialties who now have access to a fluoroscopy equipment now and uh, have no training whatsoever uh, other than uh, the fact that they put their foot on their pedal and they see beautiful images but they don't know what the harm can be uh, to the patient to that and so there have been many incidences uh, where patients have uh, uh, got substantial radiation burns and uh, the FDA when they get wind of that they don't it, this is not for uh, citing the hospital or taking legal action against them. This is purely for tracking uh, what the risks are to the, uh, to the patients from the various medical devices that are out uh, in this country. So they want to track this for this reason. So uh, 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 that's why the FDA is interested in this. Uh, 
the license and credential train staff uh, states require that. FDA has recommended this for the last 12, 15 years, uh, that this is what the hospital should be doing. But uh, until something becomes rule or until something is market driven, it doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, now in the state of Ohio, uh, it's, uh, it's a rule. Uh, in the state of Kentucky, uh, it's still a recommendation, but they will inspect you against it. So they could cite you and make life difficult for you if you don't carry it out. And there are 50 states and there are 50 different rules. The FDA is trying to get everyone to do things, but the, right now it's a recommendation, not a requirement. Uh, grant privileges and guidelines. So that's the, what the hospital medical office does, is once you've uh, shown that you're competent in a certain procedure, uh, and, and, and they will then grant you the procedure to, uh, privileges to do that procedure at that hospital. And that includes a two hours of fluoroscopic radiation training. Uh, uh, as I say, in Ohio, that two hours is mandatory. Uh, the two hours consists of general fluoro radiation safety practices, which I will go over uh, in a moment with you guys, uh, uh, which is applicable universally in, in anywhere in the country or the world. Uh, 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 and it also consists, a small portion of it consists of what's called site-specific training. Site-specific meaning like in Christ Hospital, uh, you know, they might have all G Siemens equipment, so you all know which is the pedal that shoots the x-rays, which is a boost mode, uh, which is a cine pedal, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, which buttons controls the collimators, things like that. You're the head guy in that uh, flora room. You control everything, therefore you should know which buttons does what. That's what I mean by site-specific. And that's up to the, each individual hospital to make sure that you've got that. And it has to be documented for when the inspector uh, uh, comes and looks at the records. So every hospital ke should keep a record of, well, does keep a record of that. And uh, the medical office will have your, uh, this two hours of flora radiation safety training training on record. Okay, I know this is an old uh, uh, statistic here from 1996, so you can imagine that it's at least probably about 40% uh, more than what it is uh, now, than it, well, what it was then. But uh, typical procedures is 708,000 of PTCA in 1996, uh, 192,000, and so on. Uh, so. I don't need to sort of uh, inform you of this. You already know that uh, uh, cardiac studies are a consist of a major portion of uh, uh, a hospital's business. Okay, the state undertaking recommendations. Uh, uh, w uh, the hospital and management has to convey the importance of something called the ESE. That's the entrance skin exposure, which I will go over. That's the amount of x-rays that goes into the patient. And we have to convey that uh, to the physicians and uh, let them know just how much uh, that uh, they have delivered to the patient. Convey information to physicians. Maintain qualified physicist list. Uh, that's yours truly here. Uh, uh, and we are also certified by the state. Uh, every uh, two years, we have to get our uh, qualifications and CMEs over to them, uh, to, to every state, to make sure that we're qualified as far as they're concerned. Uh, the, uh, the, the state has to establish regulations. They can't just uh, say that, yeah, you must do the, uh, have fluoro radiation safety training and then not uh, tell the uh, hospitals uh, what to do. Uh, so they've, they've established that, those guidelines. And then once that is done, obviously, uh, they, they have to inspect those hospitals to make sure that uh, what they have dictated is being carried out by the individual hospitals. Okay. The typical uh, exposures uh, that uh, the patient uh, is exposed to before what the, uh, these effects on the left hand side can be seen are for erythema, uh, the, the uh, skin reddening. A typical uh, exposure is about 200 rads. Now I know rads, yet, rads there, but I mean ronchions. And in a minute I will explain the subtle differences between the various types of radiation units. Uh, you've heard of rads, you've heard of ronchions, and you've heard of REMS. As far as you're concerned, they're equivalent. Uh, there are subtle differences, but uh, you know they're dif uh, equivalent. Uh, for x-ray exposure, we're talking about ronchions, not rads that I wrote here. And uh, for about 200 ronchions, uh, once uh, you expose a person to 200 ronchions, uh, within a few hours to uh, maybe a week or two weeks, up to three or four weeks, you will see uh, the skin reddening if you're going to see it. And that level of exposure time in a fluoro, uh, unit for a fluoro unit is within about 40 minutes, uh, 0.7 hours. So uh, a 40 minute fluoro time, uh, if you don't move that x-ray tube, just uh, point it straight at the heart from a certain angle, uh, then the, you're likely to see the skin reddening at that area there. 
uh, hair loss about 300 ronchens and you're going to see that about three weeks after the exposure uh, disquamation uh, about a thousand ronchens uh, and four weeks uh, uh, after the exp uh, exposure and so on okay so general guidelines for facilities using fluoroscopically guided procedures. Uh, what is a hospital expected to do? Uh, again, uh, they should have a patient selection criteria, the normal conduct of procedure, which I've already discussed, what the responses are to com uh, complications uh, to your procedure. If something happens, uh, what is expected of the people uh, in the room to do what? And also, typical fluoro exposure time. Uh, I get this question asked, asked by many cardiologists, you know, and they say, Keish, uh, this patient, uh, I, I've got to do another procedure on him. I've already done three procedures uh, uh, in the last two or three weeks, and he's had this much exposure. What can I expose him to now, you know, for this next procedure? And I immediately say, hey, you know, that's not my uh, a question that I can answer. Uh, that's why you guys are the doctors. You guys should know the risk benefit of every procedure that you do and it's up to you to determine whether the patient's going to de derive a greater benefit from the procedure you're about to do than uh, the risk that are involved with it. All I can tell you is how much radiation you're going to uh, expose that patient to uh, for the procedures that you're going to give to them and you, it's up to you to determine how much they've had so far, oh, sorry, well, oh, it's a, a radiation they've had and what the risk associated with that and the next procedure you're going to do, is that it, then it's up to you. Uh, and also the fluoro system operation mode. That's where also where I'll be talking about today is how to increase the uh, or adjust the parameters of the fluoroscopic unit so that you can obtain the best possible image quality that the machine is capable of at the uh, lowest dose that the patient is exposed to. We're going to talk about some of those per technical parameters and uh, hopefully uh, you know uh, you'll have a better understanding uh, after this lecture and be able to put that to practice when you do a next fluoro procedure. I also uh, uh, want to say that if you guys have any questions please stop me there and then and just ask me the question then before I move on to the next subject because you might forget and I might not cover it at the end so just anytime just ask me a question. Okay what are the administrative responsibilities? What's the, uh, the responsibilities of management at this hospital uh, to uh, you know as far as the uh, uh, healthcare is concerned? Uh, well, they have to ensure the adequate training of the operating personnel. That's why you're here. That's why I t uh, talk to the technologists operating the equipment uh, and test the equipment. Uh, so uh, the people are trained, and that's why they go through a, a good uh, s uh, school program as well. We, the hospital is encouraged to have a quality control program. Uh, oftentimes we get to hospitals and we know we're a necessary evil for those people. It doesn't help us do that work when, when they tell us to get out of there within two or their ten minutes of once we start there because they've got a patient uh, workload on. Uh, and, and so if we get that too many times, we can't test the machine, we'll just tell the management, okay, tell us when you want us here and we'll be back here again and uh, call us when you have time. And that's not conducive uh, for a good quality control program because it gets whittled down, it trickled down from senior management down to the uh, 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 technologist level who also have to do quality control and if they can see that they don't have time to do quality control that machine will drift from its normal operating parameters and ultimately you're hurting the patient uh, more than uh, you're, uh, they're uh, uh, getting a benefit so it, it works its way. It's like a, a quality control, you all know the difference between the old yo uh, uh, which is that uh, Soviet car, uh, Skoda, or I guess in a Honda, good quality control makes anything much better than what it is. That's, it's the same thing here. Uh, technical expertise, uh, you, you have access to physicists or the machine vendor application department. If a Philips has a good application department, GE, they all do. You, know, you must have access to these people to, to figure out just to, you know, how to operate the machine and what the uh, uh, you know, uh, optimum parameters are. And the, the last one is very important, what's called community standard. Uh, community standard is, st there are no rules or laws that can cover every unknown aspect of every procedures that you do here. Not, ev not everything can be written in black and white. Uh, so what would be reasonably expected uh, of a hospital uh, or anything like this? Uh, what would somebody else do? And, and that's what you must do, and that's what uh, you 
were asking me earlier uh, uh, about uh, JC, which I'm told is called JC now, not JCO anymore, uh, uh, is you must follow community standards. So uh, in a court of law, that will carry a lot of weight. Uh, that if you've if you've done everything what is reasonable expected of you, uh, for example, uh, physics testing. Uh, I come and do the physics testing. You have that done every year, and if I've done that and I tell you everything is working and it's not working very well, then you know, and you take my word for it. You followed community standards. You know, uh, it it that that helps you. So that, that's important. Okay. Requi reporting requirements. All radiation-related deaths, injuries should be reported to the FDA. Uh, that's uh, should, by the way. There is a difference between should and shall, as far as legal uh, 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 nomenclature is concerned. Should is a recommendation. Shall is a requirement. Uh, the FDA, as I said, only wants to know this so that they can uh, relate that back to the vendor and say that, yeah, okay, this machine caused this death. Uh, could you have this make this kind of improvement in your? And the FDA works with the vendor to improve that machine all the time. So that's why they need to know that information. The SMDA, the act that was passed in 1990, requires hospital to do this. If a patient dies, obviously you're going to have to tell some government agency. In this case, if they pass because of equipment malfunction, uh, you know, you, uh, the FDA would like to know that too. And uh, the third thing is the FDA has been considering making this mandatory. So uh, uh, if that happens, just like MQSA, you all know MAMO is very heavily regulated. They put their foot in there, and nobody has too much leeway to change their uh, QC program. They could easily do that for any other imaging modalities in the department, but they don't. Uh, but they can if they wanted to. OK, let me go over the units. Uh, the first unit I'd like to talk about is what's called the Rontgen. This is a unit you've probably heard the most. Every uh, every month you submit your film badge to somebody. Uh, this is a, uh, in the olden days, this was a film badge. It's purely a film badge, the, the film that was in your camera, which you pressed a button and uh, had light exposed to. And then the film is sent off to some laboratory. They develop that film. The film comes out with a certain level of grayness. Uh, that level of grayness determines how much X-ray radiation went through the light seal tight envelope here. And the greater the grayness, the greater the exposure, hence they can assume that that's how much you were exposed to. That's purely what it was. This is not a film anymore. It's a, it's a crystal, just like looks like sugar. Uh, however, that sugar, when it's exposed to radiation, like x-rays, just stores that energy. It's an, it's an energy that is stored in there. And then when they receive this back again, they put that store in some sort of a crucible, which gets pushed into an oven. As it heats it lightly, that, uh, those crystals re uh, emit light. And the amount of light that is emitted determines how much radiation went through it. That's just technology. It's the same thing. What that tells you measures is directly the exposure. Now, when I say exposure, I mean how much radiation is there, not how much was absorbed by the body. So that's why I said the ESE is an entrance skin exposure. It says how much radiation was incident on the patient, but not necessarily how much goes uh, is absorbed by that patient. So that's where the Ronchen is a unit that is lacking, uh, because it doesn't tell you uh, uh, what the risk associated with it. So uh, the, the next uh, unit that was introduced is called the RAD. Uh, RAD now actually defines uh, how much radiation is absorbed. So uh, uh, it's, an, it's an energy, when I say that, a certain amount of energy absorbed, uh, and it's defined only for x-rays. So, uh, and I know you're not interested, but it's defined as depositing 0.01 joules per kilogram in any medium. So if it's only defined for x-rays, then there are different types of radiation. You all know you've got alphas, gammas, protons, neutrons. They're all radiation of some sort. They can all go into your body, and they can all do different amounts of damage to your body. So uh, one rad from x-rays is not as harmful as one rad as alpha particles is not as harmful as one rad rad as neutrons. So even the rad is a unit that is lacking uh, in its definition. So uh, scientists, uh, being what they are, said, OK, in that case, let's introduce a third term, what we shall call the dose equivalent. And what this is, this is defined as a radiation of any uh, a radiation in an organ type. So they just purely take that rad number. Uh, they multiply it by a quality factor. They, they do some measurements, and they say that, OK, <laughs> Alpha particles do 20 times as much damage as gamma uh, rays. Gamma is the same as x-rays. Okay, So that quality factor for alpha is 20. 
uh, for neutrons, uh, it's uh, 10, uh, and so on. So whichever particle uh, it is, whichever radiation type it is, that's what that quality factor means. They take a number and multiply it by uh, a certain number to give you what's called the dose of coolant. But the risk from one rem of dose of coolant results in different risks to different organs. What that means is that, let's say I get a dose equivalent of one rem to my liver, uh, but the radio sensitivity of the liver organ might be different from the heart or the brain or the eye lens. So now, you know, you, you have to take into consideration the different levels of radio sensitivity for on the body as well. So even the dose equivalent is not a complete definition. So we take yet another fudge factor, multiply the DE by that uh, number, uh, what's called a weighting factor, that WF, and what that gives you is what's called the effective dose equivalent. And unfortunately, the unit of this is also REM. So there, REMs have three different types. And when I'm talking about <coughs> effective dose equivalent, now uh, what we, uh, when I say that the liver has received one REM of effective dose equivalent, uh, then you can assume that that's the same risk as one rem of EDE received to the heart or to the brain or to the eye lens. Uh, what do I mean by risk? Any sort of radiological damage that's going to occur down the road uh, that affects the organ's uh, uh, performance uh, or uh, its ability to uh, maintain, uh, I guess, a, a physiological constant uh, in, that in, in the body. So it's the same, the one REM of EDE now I equates to the same level of risk associated to that patient. Okay, the, uh, uh, the, the way we think of the EDE then uh, is not to say uh, just the liver or the heart or the, when I say one REM of effective dose equivalent, it's assumed that that's the radiation given to the whole body, not a single organ. And it's a whole body dose. So sometimes uh, when you look at your radiation reports, you might see a deep dose or you might see whole body dose. They're the same thing, so it mean, has the same meaning. Okay, as uh, radiation workers, we are all given a badge like this. If you do work with radiation and the hospital's radiation safety officer determines that you are going to be exposed to more than 100 millirems in a given year, and I'll explain uh, uh, rems in, uh, in that a bit more in a moment, he or she will uh, assign you a film badge and you will wear that film badge only while you're, uh, as it pertains to your employment. So uh, if you go into a hospital as a patient and you have an x-ray procedure done, it's very important that it be stressed that you don't wear the film badge anymore during that. There's not a, a, a patient-related issue, it's an employment-related issue. So uh, by wearing this badge, you are restricted to five REMS whole body dose. All 50 states, most of the world uh, country, in fact, I don't know any country that has any other number other than five REMS in a given year for a radiation worker. Now. If, if when I say radiation worker, you can assume that there is also a non-radiation worker like uh, a secretarial staff or clerical staff or security or nurses who are not working. They're what's called non-occupational workers or non-radiation workers and they must be restricted to, no more expo to exposure no more than just 100 millirems in a given year. So as a radiation worker, we're restricted to five REMs per year. One REM is a large unit of radiation, so you split that up into a thousand. So one REM is equal to a thousand millirems. Five REMs is therefore uh, uh, 5,000 millirems in a year. So a non-occupational worker must be restricted to just 100 millirems. So I'm trying to give you a perspective. 5,000 millirems for us, 100 millirems for non-occupational workers. Obviously, they're not going to be exposed to any radiation from uh, uh, employment-associated duties, but what that means is that if they're working in a room next to an x-ray procedure room, then there must be enough shielding in that wall so that if they spend full time at their desk over there and this machine is used uh, full time, then the amount of x-rays going through do not expose them to more than 100 millirems. That's, that's what, they, what that 100 millirems comes from. Okay. That's the whole body dose. Individually, the eye lens can be exposed to no more than 15 rems per year, and the individual organs of the body is no more than 50 rems per year. Now, this is slightly confusing. You say, how can individual organs be exposed to more than the whole body? That's just a way. That weighting factor that I just talked to you about, that's a fraction. Okay, that's not a whole number, that's a fraction. So that's why uh, these higher numbers come out for individual organs, and for the whole body, it's a smaller number. 
uh, as radiation workers right now, we are restricted to a, uh, a, a simple formula as to how much radiation we can receive. As I said, five rems a whole body. We cannot start um, uh, X-ray related employment until the age of 18. So if when we reach 30, which is 12 years later, we must not have been exposed to more than 60 rems uh, in, uh, by that a birthday, by, the, by our 30, 30th birthday. Is that okay? Uh, this formula, they're trying to uh, uh, make in recommendation that people go by this rule here and not that uh, 30 rems. This one would restrict you to just 30 rems, whereas the current rule restricts you to 60 rems. But this is the only a recommendation. Uh, okay, uh, as I said, individual members working around this x ray room must not be exposed to more than 100 millirems per year. Uh, also, in a corridor outside the room or in an adjacent room, uh, the amount of X-ray exposure produced in the X-ray room itself must not increase the exposure rate at more than two millirems in any one hour. So that secretary sitting in the room, the opposite outside, mu must not be exposed to more than two millirems in any one hour, okay, or 100 millirems in one year. Okay, Alara. What does ALARA mean? It stands for as low as reasonably achievable, uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it, you've got to take into consideration economic factors as well. So uh, if certain x-ray procedure, uh, uh, you know, if, you go, if a hospital wants to introduce that, it must shield the walls, it must train the people, uh, and it uh, has to can buy the equipment. And as far as radiation safety is concerned, uh, in order to shield the wall, it could add tons and tons of lead to the wall, but it might increase the cost of the procedure per patient to a million dollars. Okay? Well, nobody expects uh, that kind of commitment from anybody. So that's why it says taking economic factors into consideration as well. So lead is put into the wall, but let's not go crazy as to how much lead we put in there. Going back to here, five rems in a year. As I said, one rem is a very large unit of exposure, so we break it up into thousands. So that's 5,000 millirems in a given year that we can be exposed to. The, the, the people who approach that, uh, or who are likely to approach that, are physicians. Not as physicists or the technologists, it's the physicians who actually work in front of the primary beam itself, and they are likely to get, they're the ones who are exposed to the highest amount of those, but the, I still haven't come across anybody who's exposed to anywhere near five rems even then, okay? So it is a quite a high, high uh, uh, dose. Uh, 5,000 millirems in a year, one year can be split off into four quarters. So that's uh, 5,000 divided by four is 1,250 millirems. One tenth of 1,250 is 125 millirems. In one quarter, i.e. in a three month period, if somebody exceeds Alara 1, which is 125 millirems, alarm bells start ringing. The person who gets the report looks that, and as soon as they see a triple digit number for against a given name, they say, uh-uh, why did that happen? They will then go to that person or inform the person's supervisor and says, hey, uh, Joe Smith got uh, 137 millirems in last quarter. It's always after the fact, unfortunately, in the last quarter, okay? And say, speak to that person, you know, why did this happen? What, did they forget the badge somewhere? Did they leave it in the fluoro room? Did they put it in the washing? Did they leave it on the, uh, the windowsill of a hot car? Uh, all these things heat uh, add, add to the d radiation uh, measurement. So look for an excuse, uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, but at this stage, the dose is still quite low enough that other, other than a verbal investigation, a verbal transfer of information, nothing else needs to be done. Three times Alara 1, 125 millirem, is 375 millirem. Now bigger alarm bells start ringing. Now the RSO uh, will actually come down to the floor speak to the person involved and says what happened what did you what you know did you do many many pr uh, patients that month uh, uh, look for all the reasons and if there are no excuses to why that happened then we say that the person actually received that amount of dose and we let it let that dose go against that person's record uh, as uh, you know indefinitely so that's uh, what we put it down to we must by law also generate a, a report of what happened why the high dose if we can explain it why it happened and what corrective action we're going to do in the future. That has to be generated. Uh, and the person who, who was involved uh, says, okay, well, you know, do you agree with this? You come to an agreement and then you write, uh, get that person to sign that report and make sure that, you know, everybody's aware of what happened and what's going to uh, 
prevent it in future. And then you, you file that report uh, in your uh, the radiation safety office, or we say keep it in the employment file, wherever it doesn't matter, as long as it's kept somewhere. Alara level one, Alara level two also has to be presented at a quarterly meeting uh, that the hospitals have to have. It's called the Radiation Safety Committee, uh, uh, and we get, have this meeting every quarter uh, where senior management is there, everybody from the department that uses X-ray, one representative is there, uh, we're there, uh, and the hospital's radiation safety officer is there, and we discuss radiation-related issues there, and we say two people exceeded uh, Alara 1, three people exceeded Alara 2, uh, necessary paperwork was generated, and that's all that needs to be said about it. Okay. Okay, cardinal principle, you all know this, time, distance, and shielding. You've had this drummed into you many, many times over. Obviously, you know, the, the, the amount of exposure that the patient gets, that the scatter radiation that you guys get and everybody get, is directly related to time. Double the time, double the exposure. Okay, distance, this is a, a what's called an inverse square related fact. So if you double the distance, you decrease the radiation exposure by quarter. To, uh, by, by a fourth, okay? So it's an inverse square law. Double the distance, quarter the dose. Shielding. Uh, shielding is an amazing uh, uh, reduction, gives an amazing reduction in radiation dose. Uh, let, me, let me say that I, I said five rems per year is what we're restricted to because we wear this film badge. A typical fluoro ex unit will expose a patient to five R per minute, okay? Five rems per year is our limit. Patient can easily get five R per minute. Okay, at a, a th rule of thumb, at one meter from the primary beam. So if the primary beam enters into the patient here, and it's uh, let's say about uh, uh, what is it, six inches by six inches f uh, cone uh, field of view there. At one meter from that distance, you're typically the f where the physician is going to be standing. Typically going to be exposed to one thousandth at that level. So if it's five R per minute, five thousand uh, R per minute that the patient gets, then you're going to get one thousandth of that, which is, what's one thousandth of five thousand? Five uh, milli R per minute. That's what you're getting, right? Typical flora procedure time, what is it, about 20 minutes, 10 minutes? Or anybody want to give you an example? What's your typical floor exposure time? For routine death, um, two and a half, three minutes for a very prolonged, you know, chronic total occlusion, which could be an hour, an hour and a half. And those are x-ray on time? Those are unusual, the long one, but typical would be two and a half, three minutes for a diagnostic death. Okay, all right. Let's, let's say five minutes done at the worst case, okay? Five minutes at five milli R per minute for you guys. That's what you're getting, right? So that's about 25 MR per patient that you're doing. Worst case, you're going to do five patients a day? You might do five patients a day? Yeah? Uh, 25 times five patients is 125 MR per day that you're getting. You work five day a week, so uh, 125 times five is 600, right? 625. <laughs> Sorry about that. 625 MR per week. That's how much you're going to get, right? 52 weeks, you have 50 weeks a year. You guys have two weeks of vacation at least, I'm sure, okay? So uh, at, uh, instead of 625, let me just say half, uh, 500 MR or half MR per week, you're going to get about 25 R per year. That's how much you're going to get. You're restricted to this 5 R per year. You're going to break the law within uh, f uh, one fifth of the year, aren't you? Which is about uh, two months. That means legally, hospitals can't let you work, uh, do any more x-ray procedures after two and a half months. You can't, they're prevented from doing you, even though you have the privilege. You can't do it legally. So the best way to reduce that is shielding. Shielding means put a lead apron on, okay? Lead goggles if, you, if they're not too inconvenient for you. Put them on. When you wear a lead apron, a lead apron is to have a certain amount of lead equivalent material inside it, okay? Lead is a very good attenuator of x-rays. And they're not made of lead, but they're made of something material which might be lead equivalent. So with a half a millimeter of lead equivalent, which is most lead apron that you and I use in hospital, that will reduce your radiation dose by almost 95%, okay? Just build by that. So uh, that's why shielding is an excellent attenuator of x-rays. Strongly recommended that you be worn. And, uh, uh, and most hospitals will not get away without wearing one for too long. Okay, all right. Certainly employees will not. They will be uh, disciplined, but physicians, they have to handle, we have to handle you guys with uh, kid gloves, I'm afraid. You know, so it takes a bit longer.
but then we, the hospital administration would be seriously liable if, uh, if they did that, so they would stop you doing it sooner so, or later. So you wear two badges, you have one inside and then you have a thyroid. Okay, good question, uh, I, I, I nearly forgot that. Yeah, uh, the, when you're working with x-rays, the cataract, uh, cataract of the eye lens is a major concern uh, that you're going to get. So we want to try to figure out how much the ca uh, eye lens are going to get. And we also want to try and figure out how much the uh, whole body gets, okay? So we recommend for people working with fluoro, they wear two badges, okay? One badge is worn at the collar level, outside of any collar lead apparel that you might wear. And one is worn at the chest or the waist level, behind any lead aprons that you're going to wear. Not out, it's important that you do that. But if you don't do that, by looking at the reports, we can figure out that you didn't do that. So, you know, we know that. But the, it should be worn outside. This badge here guesstimates how much radiation dose the eye lens is going to get. And a combination of this badge reading and that badge reading, if worn properly, as I've just described, can give you the estimate of how much the whole body has received. Okay? Usually it's a. Uh, uh, oh, the, the formula is uh, skipping my brain. I think, I'm, I'm guessing, I, I think it's 5% of that reading plus just 3% of that badge's reading uh, 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 equals to the whole body dose. So, two bad it's, it's important that you guys working with floors wear two badges and you wear lead aprons and that you wear them, as I've just said, at the waist level or the chest level, inside the lead apron, the collar one, outside of any lead apron. If you're wearing goggles, you're really not getting that, That's right. That's right. We're erring, we're erring uh, on the caution side, okay? So if you're wearing goggles, it's even less. And then, uh, uh, it, it, so there is a, so what we do in that case is that we ignore it as long as it doesn't exceed a Lara 1. So even if you're wearing goggles, if you exceed a Lara 1, Okay, somebody comes and sees you, right? And then they say, hey, you know, Doc, you got uh, 137 milligrams in last quarter. And they say, I will goggles, you know, I didn't get that kind of ready. So then the, the, the RSO will pick up the phone, phone Landauer, who uh, processes this, and say, for this person, they wore goggles, we recommend you take the dose down by 82.5%, uh, because that's how much the attenuation factor is for the lead. So we'll bring it down that way. Okay? All right. But... Despite the fact that you know uh, uh, radi we're working, we have background radiation all the time anyway. So whether you work with X-rays or not, background radiation, natural radiation, which comes from radon uh, under the ground, cosmic radiation, terrestrial, internal from the potassium-40 that's inside his body. Typically, the sum total uh, is about 300 milligrams per year. Uh, Man-made radiation, which includes the medical X-rays, nuclear medicine, consumer products that includes TV, microwaves cell phones, they, they contribute to 7 milligrams uh, in a year and other, uh, which includes uh, the uh, atomic bomb tests of the 50s and the 60s by America, France, Britain, uh, and Russia and all those countries, uh, the, uh, the what they threw out into the atmosphere, that contributes 1 milligram in a given year. Add the two together, it's about 350, 60 milligrams per year, which w on average we're all getting anyway. So it's about 1 milligram per year we're all getting from background. Okay. Uh, if you have an employee or your colleague uh, who's pregnant, uh, uh, the action cannot be taken until the, that person uh, informs her boss uh, in writing. Uh, and, and the information they convey in writing is the name, the social security number, and the conception date uh, that must be given. Once that is given to the supervisor, the supervisor then issues an extra fetal badge. So if you're wearing one badge, you'll be given a second badge. If you're wearing two badges, you'll be given a third badge. That third, th the additional badge, uh, for some strange reason, they issue it, but it's worn at exactly the same location as you wear the collar, uh, not the collar, the, 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 the chest or the, the waist badge. Under, underneath the lead apron. So I don't know why they have to issue that, but they do. Uh, and the reason why we con the, like to know the conception date as well is because the fetus must be restricted to just 500 millirems uh, during those nine months that the uh, female is pregnant. So we have, ca have to need to know that. Okay, uh, low dose chronic exposure to radiation, the things that can result from uh, uh, so radiation uh, is leukemia, usually 8 to 10 years down the road, bone cancer, 15 years down the road, uh, thyroid cancer, uh, lung cancer, all those things uh, somebody can contract purely by working with radiation. 
Okay, what do we mean by risk associated with? Well, I said we're restricted to five REMs, okay? One REM of exposure, uh, 125 to 450 people uh, will uh, have a, a, in a cancer of some sort uh, out of one million people on top of the 250,000 who would normally going to get cancer anyway. It's unfortunately anywhere from 25% to one third of the population are going to get cancer of some sort at some stage in their life. If you expose one million of them to one rem of radiation, then you're going to increase that number from 250,000 up to uh, by about from 125 to one 450. So that's, that's what that unit means. Okay. What, okay, th this is what you guys are interested in. The Ten Commandments for Fluoroscopic X-rays. Uh, a, a patient size uh, controls the uh, uh, X-ray exposure. Uh, a thin patient doesn't have a, 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 a very thick body part there. X-rays now can get through that patient easily. And so uh, uh, the patient size controls the total dose that the patient gets and the dose rate that the machine operates. I said five rems is a typical output rate for a fluoro machine. If it's a thin patient, it could be as low as two rems per minute. If it's an obese patient, uh, under regular fluoro mode, it could be uh, as high as nine or legally no more than 10 uh, R per minute. Okay, so patient size is a very important factor in uh, the amount of radiation exposure that everybody gets. Okay. The next two items, uh, it says keep MA low and keep KVP high. You don't really don't have to worry about that. The machine uh, has already got enough uh, 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 bells and whistles that it does this for you automatically. It's called ABC, automatic brightness control, so that when you put your foot on the pedal, the, it can, the machine can see, figure out what the size of the patient is. And if, it, if the patient is big, it knows that it has to increase the technique so more x-rays can go through so that the amount of brightness of the image uh, that you see on the monitor is always constant. It compensates for it. That's called ABC, automatic brightness control. However, what that machine tries to do is that it tries to keep the MA as low as possible and it increases the KVP. KVP is what's called the, the, the penetrability of the x-ray. The higher the KVP, the more penetrating the x-ray becomes. Uh, it, unfortunately, it also adds to the radiation exposure to the patient in a, in, in a square, uh, uh, a square related uh, uh, factor. If you double the current, the MA, you double the X-ray exposure. But if you increase the KV, KVP, it uh, you know, increases substantially more than double. Okay, you want to try to maximize the source table distance. Typically, uh, in, a, in a cardiac cath lab, the X-ray tube is at the bottom. Okay, so what you want to do is that the X-ray tube has some sort of a spacer, at least a 12-inch spacer. You don't want to try and remove that. If you remove that because you think you, the, you want more X-rays to go through the patient, then right at the X-ray port itself, you have the patient skin there, not too far away. It's like uh, you know having uh, uh, your uh, a sunbeam concentrated onto a small point there, like a, a with a magnifying glass. You're zapping that patient. You're burning that little region there in the patient. So you want to keep a certain amount of distance. Uh, you know, for le and this is a legal requirement to have that 12 inches spacer there. So you want to try and inc raise the table, try to lower the X-ray tube, uh, you know, as much as you can uh, do so. That goes against the grain because by raising the table, you're taking the X-ray source and the uh, image receptor far away. So because the distance is involved, the inverse squalor, now you think I'm going to have to use more X-rays, but that's that's just, just the way it works. So increase the X-ray source to the patient distance decrease the II distance to the patient. You want to decrease that, okay? What that does is now you're trying to decrease the distance in the inverse square law to bring the radiation dose down. It also improves the image uh, uh, quality. Look at my hand there. If my hand w is very close here, then you can't see it, but the sha believe me, the shadow of my hand, the edges are nice and crisp, okay? This thing here, the, the screen, is what the II is, the image intensifier, okay? If I move my hand away, you, can't, you can see the edges getting blurred now, can't you? As I move that away, yeah? Just like that, you can see the edges getting blurred. So you, if, the, if this was the patient, that was the II. As I bring it closer, the edge gets crisper, and it gets better. It also does something else. 
it decreases what's called the distortion. The distortion uh, is, def is defined as when you're looking at a fixed one organ whose magnification at one is variable, varies with the depth of the uh, inside the body. So for the heart, uh, at the the organ, the part of the heart that's closest to the image intensifier has a lower magnification than the part of the heart that's far away from the eye. eye. So that's called distortion. So by increasing, uh, by bringing the organ as close as possible to the eye, eye you're minimi you're mini minimizing the distortion and you're improving the uh, image quality. Okay, uh, try not to use the mag mode. Uh, if you use the mag mode then what you're doing is you're squaring uh, the amount of exposure in a, uh, you're increasing the exposure in a smaller region and it's related to a factor of the square of the differences in the area between the normal um, uh, mag magnification, normal mode and the mag mode. So the higher the magnification mode, the much, much greater radiation dose you're, you're giving to the patient and yourself too. Okay, if it's a small patient, then uh, the, that patient does not have too much of a scatter for that patient. So uh, because scatter is minimized, you can remove the grid. If the grid is purely there to remove stray radiation. If you remove the grid, the image quality is going to be uh, slightly degraded, but for small patients, the scatter is not there, so you can do that. Uh, tight collimation, you only uh, cone the beam down to the region that you're interested in. There's no need to expose the surrounding region, uh, so that's number eight. Number nine, use aprons, shielding, monitor the doses, and uh, uh, and position yourself and the uh, uh, people working around the patient. You know, to ask them to stand far away if they if they don't have to be close to you. And so that's what uh, number nine is. And number ten, what's called the golden rule: keep the beam on time to a minimum. So don't put your foot on the pedal if the image looks wonderful. You have something called last image hold. Okay, take your foot off there. You can see that image there. Okay, so remember to do that. Okay, I know it's a common sense for you and I who know this, but for a physician who's not been trained in X-ray, they they have no idea that you know they shouldn't keep their foot on the pedal, and that that's the that's the biggest factor that uh, controls the X-ray exposure to everyone. Okay, what are the, some of the injuries? I'm sure you've all seen this picture here. I'm sorry it's not a very good quality, but that, that, that picture on the top left-hand side shows the patient only uh, within a few hours after the procedure. Hardly uh, any damage there, but as time progresses, you can see it get, the damage gets worse and worse. Okay? Uh, over this, and this is just purely over several weeks. Okay? Breast cancer uh, induced by fluoroscopic x-rays on this patient here. This is a dentist's finger. Even they work with x-rays, and you can see the kind of uh, r radiation damage that they can be attached to. And they, theirs is a very small beam for, for the, the dental units. They have a very small beam, and their techniques are much lower than your guys because the finger is so, uh, you know, uh, the, the so, so small. Okay, fluoroscopic setup. Then, here's what we have. Uh, you have the x-ray tube here. Uh, the x-ray tube fires the x-rays. Uh, large distance here. This is the cone, the separator cone there. Uh, the p the when the patient x-rays hit the patient, uh, you get scatter radiation going off, exposing yourself and the people working around the table. Uh, the entrance exposure is measured here at this point there. X-rays go through. A certain amount of x-rays obviously has to go through the patient. So when the eye receives that radiation, it is able to electronically form the image on the monitor. The brightness on the monitor, if it's not bright enough, this sends a signal to the, uh, the generator of the x-ray tube saying increase the KV, increase the MA until you get enough x-rays going through to increase the brightness. So it's a feedback, uh, electronic feedback that determines how much, uh, what technique to set it at. But this is the setup there. Okay, entrance skin exposure. Uh, rates vary, as I said, anywhere from less than one R per minute to greater than 10 R per minute. Now, X fl the floor equipment downstairs can be operated in various modes. They have the regular fluoro mode, which is restricted to just 10 R per minute. But unfortunately, some patients are obese. You know, they weigh more than 225, 250 pounds. And you can't operate the machine at regular fluoro mode because it's restricted to just 10 R per minute. So what some physicians do, uh, and unbeknownst to them, is that if they move their f uh, foot to the next pedal, they put it into cine mode. Unfortunately, cine mode gives you exquisite images, excellent image quality, but there's a payoff. 
Cine exposes the patient to, it could be as high as 100 R per minute. Okay, fluoro legally required uh, to be 10 R per minute or less. Cine, there is no legal requirement, but you're going to expose a patient to 100 R per minute. Okay. That was with the old Kodak film cine that you used to have there. The, the, now with digital systems, it is still exquisite images, but they've brought the dose down s substantially, but it still could be as high as 50 R per minute to the patient. And because these images look very nice indeed, uh, you know, this hospital has had so many cases where the physicians put their foot on the cine, and instead of doing regular fluoro, they were operating the machine under cine. And so that's why uh, I'm, I, I was asked to come and give this lecture to you guys, so that, you know, saying that be sure you're not operating the machine under cine mode. That's why I always urge the hospitals to buy a machine that has what's called boost mode. Boost mode is still uh, fluoro mode, but it's fluoro times two. So they're legally required to be less than 20 R per minute, but for an obese patient, whereas 10 might not be enough, 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 might be enough to give you a decent quality image, but there's no need to put it into cine mode, which will immediately take it up to 50 R per minute or 30 R per minute. And uh, you know, that's why I say it's important machines have boost mode, but unfortunately, not many have those. Okay. We also say to the hospitals, if your patient has more than 40 minutes of uh, uh, x-ray on time, let us have the details so we can calculate the exposure to that patient. Okay, so when, when I calculate an exposure to the uh, patient uh, of, let's say, um, 800R, that you've exposed this patient to 800R, the, the physician who did the procedure should be informed of that fact, and also uh, uh, the referring physician or the, doc the patient's physician should be told of that fact as well. I said should, it's not a shall, okay? Uh, but this is for legal requirements. You're covering yourself as well, saying that, you know, we, 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 we investigated it, this was the best uh, time, uh, and you, you want to also talk about this in your grand rounds as well. For any complex procedures that were done, say that such and such patient, I did this, did this, and just get your uh, peers to agree with you, saying that, yes, this was indeed a complex case. Any physician would have taken this length of time, so that if you're legally covering yourself, uh, you can say that, you know, it was a complex case. Uh, uh, physicians should know how to reduce radiation injuries, we've just discussed that, and long-term harm, we've discussed that too. Patient size, II needs a certain amount of x-rays to give a certain image quality. That's what I meant, the image intensifier needs a certain amount of x-rays going through it to give you a certain quality of image. Big patient attenuates more x-rays, therefore they use a higher technique. That was the KVP, the kilo voltage, and the current going through it. A patient dose factor can be as high, 10 times greater than a thin patient. Okay, these are all just reiterating what I've just told you already, uh, uh, again. Do I have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.